Hello and welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Our movie this time around is 1959's Teenagers from Outer Space, directed by Tom Grafe. Instructions are to prepare for an attack by an unknown enemy. That's what he meant. Answer me, or I destroy you! Stop! There's something behind this, something we don't understand. The weapon he uses, it's unheard of. Blasting flesh right off the bones. Master control to fleet, set flight pattern to minus point zero eight. Increase speed. They're coming right at us! Get down inside the cave! You have to admit, Teenagers from Outer Space is kind of a tantalizing title. As the children of my friends and relatives grow up and become teenagers, I finally understand the confusion parents feel when their offspring enter adolescence. I remember what kind of changes I went through when that happened to me. The feelings of awkwardness, the absolute conviction that older people just didn't understand what I was going through, and the anger that came with it, both at them and at society in general. I became a teenager in the early 70s, which was possibly the worst time in the history of this country to hit that age. Disco came in at about the same time I became old enough to start bar hopping, and all the rock clubs I'd heard so much about switched to discos. If you were into rock like I was, your social life became a nightmare. 120 beats per minute became the norm, and fashion was affected even worse than the clubs. Take a look at any movie made during the mid-70s and check out the way the people dressed. Kiana, spandex, three-piece suits, platform shoes, layered hair, and mustaches were everywhere. Well, I like the fact that women began to dress like women again. The lounge lizard look the men wore was horrendous. Even worse was the glitter look that infused rock at that time, thanks to David Bowie and Gary Glitter. It wasn't bad if you didn't mind flitting around like Tinkerbell, but that in the disco fashion was a look for skinny people. If, like me, you were built like Hagrid, the idea of skin-tight pants and gold medallions or crushed velvet suits and silver overcoats was right up there with using a bandsaw to scratch an itchy nose. Getting back onto the subject, this movie has a great title because it taps into the idea that a good number of the teenagers you see have to be from outer space. Take a walk around any mall today and you'll swear the mothership dropped the kids off on the way to Alpha Centauri. Of course, I'm sure our parents thought the same thing about us, so the world keeps turning. Teenagers from Outer Space is about a group of aliens who come to Earth to see if it would be a proper breeding ground for their main food supply, the Gargons. Gargons are what we on Earth refer to as lobsters. They're apparently fairly vicious, and they grow to astounding size in just a few days and seem to somehow walk on the ends of their tails. You never get a detailed look at the gargons since the $5,000 budget didn't allow for that, so mostly you see them as silhouettes. Actually, the budget didn't allow for much of anything in this movie. The spacesuits, which are modified gas station attendant uniforms, are trimmed with masking tape, and the space boots the aliens wear are men's shoes covered with white socks. A few of the other no-budget tricks in this movie include the use of the same skeleton for every human killed. If you look closely, you'll see the letter J in a circle written on the left hip bone. And if you don't look too closely, you'll see the eyeball screwed into the top of the skull along with the bolts holding the bones together at the joints. Other things include the incredibly phony beards and mustaches, the lack of teenagers of any kind in the movie, and the lack of blank cartridges used during the City Hall shootout. If you look, and again, you don't have to look that closely, you'll notice that when the guns fire, the flame spitting out of the barrels isn't flame at all, but scratches on the film. The house Grandpa and Betty Morgan live in is a real house. Grave kind an old woman into letting them use her house and electricity by claiming to be a UCLA student working on a film. 
The best touch though has got to be the ray gun the Trigger Happy Thor uses to blast just about everyone and everything he comes into contact with. This prop is actually a Hubley Atomic Disintegrator Ray Gun, manufactured in the early 1950s. This particular toy sold for about 10 cents at the time it was new and is now demanding nearly $300 on eBay. You may notice that sometimes the dialogue seems out of sync with the images, and the reason for this is that the dialogue was recorded before the movie was shot. Just about all the teenagers from outer space was photographed on location, and when movies are shot on location, there's a lot of extraneous noise that can't be avoided. So a filmmaker will spend a lot of money on studio time looping the dialogue. Grafe overcame this problem by recording the dialogue first and then playing it back on the set so the actors could repeat it on camera. I can only imagine what syncing it in post was like. Director, editor, cinematographer, writer, producer, composer, special effects technician, and actor, Thomas Lockyer Grafe was born on September 12th 1929 in Arizona. He graduated from UCLA in 1952 with a BA in theater arts. He appears in the film as Joe Rogers, the reporter. After making Teenagers from Outer Space, he kind of spaced out himself and proclaimed himself to be the second coming of Jesus. According to Brian Pearson, who played the Thor, the homicidal alien, he had huge meetings on the church steps and put out tremendous banners and mailings. He was a very sick person. It's sad because he was a genius in his own way. He wasn't a director at all. He was a technician. His direction was very stilted and comes across that way in the film. Everybody talked like robots because that was his idea of how aliens would talk. He worked as an editor on the film The Wizard of Mars in 1965, and in 1968, Grave placed an ad in Variety announcing a script called Orf that he described as, quote, remarkable, Tensely exciting, superbly written, a spellbinding masterpiece. Hilarious and chilling all at once. The film was the star Carol Reiner, and the asking price to purchase it was $500,000. Unfortunately, Grafe neglected to tell Reiner he was part of the package. Grafe backed off after Reiner threatened a lawsuit. He died on December 19, 1970 in San Diego, California. David Love, who appears in this film as Derek, was in four other films, his last being 2004's Jack the Snipper. According to the producers, Brian and Ursula Pearson, Grafe and Love, who were involved in a homosexual relationship, also shared a kind of mentor-protege link. Ursula Pearson remembers, Tom was closely associated in his personal life with David Love, who plays the leading role in Teenagers. We knew that Tom and Dave were homosexuals. We were very well acquainted with him and spent a lot of time together. David was the prodigy of Tom. He had very little experience in acting or anything. He was like a, he was a childlike character. Tom gave him this opportunity to become something, hoping I'm sure for stardom. That's why Tom made the picture with David in the lead. Every actor hopes for stardom and David Love hoped for that. As far as I can ascertain, Love is still alive and well and living in Los Angeles, California. Brian Pearson, as I mentioned before, appears in this film as Thor, the homicidal alien. He and his wife Ursula, who appears as Hilda, Professor Simpson's secretary, put up the $5,000 budget for this movie. When Warner Brothers Distribution picked up teenagers to put it on the lower half of a double bill with Gigantus the Fire Monster, the Pearsons ended up having to take Grave to court in an attempt to recoup their investment. Teenagers from Outer Space was the only movie they appeared in. Don Bender, who plays Betty, appeared in eight movies, starting as an infant in 1937's Confession. Teenagers from Outer Space was her last film. King Moody, who plays the spaceship captain and has the memorable line, The High Court may well sentence you to torture! I love that. Appeared in 20 movies and television shows, including Get Smart as Starker, Siegfried's assistant. He was also the original Ronald McDonald. He died on February 7, 2001 in Tarzana, California. We've shown movies worse than Teenagers from Outer Space, so viewing this one isn't quite as painful an experience as watching this show usually is. It fits quite neatly into my definition of what makes a movie good or bad. It may not be Citizen Kane, but it's never boring. There is one thing in this movie that bothers me, however. In films, there is one rule that is sacrosanct above all others, and that rule is never kill a child or a dog. 
audiences don't mind seeing adults get killed, but if you kill a kid or a dog, you lose them instantly. That rule was broken in the first five minutes of this movie. The rule doesn't apply to cats for some reason, but that's okay with me. Anyone who owns a cat knows that if trouble rears its head, that quizzling will be gone before you can turn your head, whereas a dog will get between you and whatever threat exists. I don't think anyone would object to seeing Garfield or that mangy cat from Get Fuzzy blasted into a million pieces. I know I wouldn't. Hell, I'd do it myself. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Teenagers from Outer Space, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. <laughs>